John's speaker is Jay Bucky. Uh, Jay is a professor of medicine at Dartmouth Medical School and an adjunct professor of engineering at Bayer. Uh, in 2007-2008, he was a candidate for the U.S. Senate in New Hampshire and advocated for, the, uh, for investment in technology, innovation, and a new energy economy. Uh, Jay did not volunteer the following information, so those of you who don't know him, I take the liberty of adding that in 1998, he was the payload specialist aboard the NASA space flight STS-90 as part of the Neurolab mission from April 17 to May 3, 1998. Please welcome Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for uh, having me uh, here today. And uh, as Alex uh, mentioned, from about June of 2007 till February of 2008, I was a candidate for the uh, U.S. Senate here in New Hampshire. And uh, so what I'd like to tell you about is what it's like being a scientist in politics. Um, and this isn't a scientific uh, talk. Uh, this is basically my impressions. Uh, this isn't a scientific study of being in politics. It's just what I, uh, my opinions and my thoughts about what that was like. Uh, as Alex mentioned, I've, uh, I, I had the opportunity to fly on the space shuttle back in 1998 on a mission called Neuralab. And first of all, I'd just like to mention it's, it's remarkable to be in a country that can send people into space. That's not all that common. But we uh, had an interesting mission. We sent seven people into space on the space shuttle. And we did 26 experiments that were selected competitively from around the country and around the world. And these are fairly complex experiments that would, would have been hard to do on the ground, no less to do them in space. And at that time, I'm sure all of us had the impression, well, well this was just a step on the pathway, that the future was going to be even more complex missions, even more people going into space, and just a steady advancement of this, uh, of this technology and of this, uh, this effort. But when we look at the space program today, in 2011, we see that the space shuttles are now heading to museums. So uh, in June of this year, the space shuttle will stop flying, and the shuttles will be going to museums to join the Space Lab module, which I flew on, which is already in a museum. And rather than sending seven people into space, we'll be sending three people into space on a Soyuz capsule from, uh, from Russia. And uh, just so you know, the Soyuz capsule first flew in the 1960s. And the capsule will go to the International Space Station, which is truly a remarkable engineering accomplishment. The space station is a large structure with great capabilities. But honestly, the kind of experiments that we did on Neuralab would not be possible on the International Space Station today. And the kind of missions that are being flown on the space station, which are basically six-month-long six missions, those are the same kind of missions that were the, uh, the Soviet Union was flying back in the 1980s. So what I see is a space program that's, that's actually hollowed out. It still looks good on the outside. The human space program still has a, a good look, and the space station is remarkable. But on the inside, it's hollowed out. And that became a metaphor, from, to me, to what is happening to our scientific and technical and engineering capabilities as a nation. So one uh, publication that was very influential for me was, called, uh, was a publication called uh, Rising Above the Gathering Storm. And this is a publication from the National Academy of Sciences. And it was a group of experiments that were brought together from around the country to evaluate our scientific and technical and uh, engineering capabilities. And it was a real wake-up call about uh, the problem, problems that we were going to be facing in the future. Because I think man, many of us just imagine that the United States is a great uh, technological power and will continue to be so in the future. But the kind of information it presented there was very concerning. And what I'm scrolling before you here on the screen are some facts from the updated report called uh, Rising Above the Gathering Storm Revisited. And the picture it paints is of a very concerning future. And uh, you can read some of these uh, facts that, uh, uh, that they've gathered together here. Many of these things, to address them, requires action in the political system. Because it's through politics that various agencies are funded. It's through politics that infrastructure gets built. And over time, I became more and more interested in politics and more involved. 
Uh, I got involved with different other candidates' campaigns. I started going to meetings. And then ultimately, in 2007, I decided to run myself. So uh, what I show you here, this is the front of my palm card. Uh, just so you know, every candidate who runs usually makes a palm card. And on the front, you try to put a, a heroic picture of yourself. And then on the back, uh, various bullet points about what your agenda is. And uh, so that was uh, our uh, campaign. And I want to tell, tell you, make basically four main points about running for office. One is that money doesn't talk, it shouts in politics. Two is that participation counts. A lot of people think that uh, politics is just showing up at the voting booth on election day, but it's the participation before that point that is absolutely critical. The next thing is that ideas matter, that uh, people who take the time to get their ideas out in front of the public, that that does make a difference over time. And then lastly, as we all know, you need to vote. So when I first got started uh, in this, when I would tell people that I was a candidate, if I went to somebody who uh, wasn't involved in politics, someone who, let's say, hadn't been in, worked on a campaign in the past or didn't routinely go to political meetings, if I told them that I was running for office, the usual response was something like this. They would say, well, what's your platform? What's your agenda? What's your plan? What is it that you stand for? What do you, what, why, what do you hope to accomplish? If, however, I was talking to somebody who was in politics, someone who had been involved in a campaign in the past or maybe had run themselves or was a county chair or uh, someone who, would, who was active in the party, the first thing they would ask, and this was invariably the case, how much money do you think you can raise? So that was the number one question. And, uh, and I think I'll uh, try to give you some example of why people ask that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some data from a recent Senate race. And this is the 2010 Senate race here in New Hampshire. And I'll take you through some of the spending figures from that race so you can see what it takes to do a campaign. Uh, just so you know, in New Hampshire, New Hampshire is a population of about 1.5 million people, and probably about four to 500,000 show up on Election Day to vote. And in 2010, there were two candidates. It was uh, Paul Hodes, who was a Democratic candidate, and uh, Kelly Ayotte, who was the Republican candidate, and it was Kelly Ayotte who won. And what you see here is that the amount spent ranged from about three and a half million to, to five million, and both candidates together spelt, spent uh, more than eight million dollars. Uh, you can see how that broke down. PAC contributions, that's political action committee contributions, uh, were a small part most of the contributions were individual contributions. So given individuals donating uh, money to the campaign. And that's how they got their uh, financing. Also, just keep in mind, this is not all the money that was spent. This is just what the candidates spent. So there are other organizations and groups that may spend on issue ads. And uh, the, so you may have seen some of those ads during the campaign that they weren't sponsored by the campaign, but they may have been sponsored by the party or different groups that are also spending on this campaign. So you look at this and you figure, well, that's, uh, most of this money must be coming from New Hampshire, right? Because people who live in New Hampshire would be concerned about who their Senate, uh, senator is going to be, and so they'd be contributing to these campaigns. But if you thought that most of this money comes from New Hampshire, you'd, uh, you'd be wrong. Now, this is the breakdown, and this is from Open Secrets, which is a, uh, a website that compiles this in, uh, information. And uh, what it shows is the green bar is money from in-state, and the red bar is from out-of-state. And uh, down here, you can see that breakdown. So about two-thirds of the funding came from out-of-state for both candidates. So most of the funding that go came into New Hampshire to run a New Hampshire Senate race does not come from New Hampshire. It comes from out of town. And you might wonder, well, what kind of people contribute to these campaigns? I mean, where do these people come from? Where do they work? Uh, how, who, who are the people who are contributing? And on this next slide, I'll, I'll take you through that. So this slide shows the, the industries uh, that are most highly represented in supporting the campaigns. Uh, how this is compiled is that when you contribute to a candidate, you have to put down your occupation and who you work for. 
And so this uh, website, Open Secrets, puts that together and also you know, puts in the information from PACs, what industries they might be associated with, and then puts together this list of the top industries that are contributing to each candidate. And what I want to take you through is let's look at some, uh, some uh, groups that are at the top here. We see that uh, securities investment is right up here at the top for both candidates. Lawyers and law firms are at the top for both candidates. Retired people are at the top for both candidates. Real estate also at the top uh, for both candidates. But what's notable is what's not up there. Do you see anything that comes from science, technology, engineering? There may be some businesses, perhaps, that are peripherally related to that, but I don't really, um, I don't really see a big representation of people who might be very concerned about science and technology and innovation. And you might, uh, I mean, we see lodging and tourism, food and beverage, TV, movies, and music. So those, those groups are, are represented on this list. Uh, just to, by uh, looking around here now, probably if everybody in this room gave $1,000, the Thayer School would be on this list. So that uh, just gives you a sense of uh, where the money comes from. And I want to give you a more specific example uh, to get, get it down to more individual level to see what does this mean if you compare uh, different people who give to campaigns. And so what I want to do is I want to take you to the Federal Election Commission website. And if you go there, you can look up uh, an individual and see how much they contributed to campaigns. And the first person I'll take you to is going to be Lloyd Blankfein. Lloyd Blankfein is the uh, pres chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. And we can look up and see uh, how much he has contributed to uh, campaigns in the past. And uh, so I went ahead and. Uh, filmed my screen when I did this, just in case we uh, did work out. And so we put in Lloyd Blank fine, we hit the button there, and then we can scroll down through his contributions, and we can see he's contributed about $160,000 to uh, political campaigns uh, that we can find here in the uh, Federal Election Commission website. So I'm trying to think, well, what's a comparison, a person that we could compare that to? Somebody who might be in an area that we're familiar with, you know, who's, who's interested in science and technology and engineering, might be a leader in that area, might be somewhat academic. So I thought, well, how about the president of MIT? Why don't we look at the president of MIT and see how uh, any difference there? And the president of MIT is Susan Hockfield. So let's do a search there. And uh, we can put in uh, Susan Hockfield. And uh, $300. Now, I'm not trying to pick on anybody here. And you got to remember that the Federal Election Commission's website only lists contributions above $250. So people who gave less than that, multiple $25 contributions, or a lot of $100 contributions, that wouldn't be noted here. And also, I'm sure that Susan Hockfield makes a lot less money than uh, Lloyd Blankfein does. But nevertheless, the difference is striking. So uh, there is a big difference here in, when you look at who is supporting political campaigns. So I got introduced to campaign finance then when I got started in my campaign. And I'll tell you about my experience with that. Uh, one thing that happened uh, early on, and which was very exciting for us, is that Joe Trippi uh, wrote a favorable blog post about our campaign. And for those of you who uh, don't know Joe Trippi, he was, the, uh, he was the person behind the Dean campaign's uh, internet finance revolution. And he's, he's been involved in political campaigns for many years, a well-known political consultant, and, and wrote a book called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, which tells about his experience in uh, raising money for the Dean campaign. So he took an interest in our campaign and got picked up in the press. And uh, he was in New Hampshire and, and said he was going to come by and uh, talk with me. So uh, we sat down in the uh, Salt Hill uh, restaurant over in Lebanon, and uh, he looked at me and he said, don't you know 50 people who will give you $1,000? And I, I kind of looked. Uh, um, <laughs> so he, he decided to rephrase that and said, you must know 50 people who will give you $1,000. And again, when I was kind of giving him this uh, deer in the headlights look, 
He said, I want you to make a list of 50 people who will give you $1,000, and I want you to call them and ask them for $1,000. So you couldn't have made it more clear. <laughs> so that was my introduction, that if I was going to be a candidate, I needed to get on the phone and ask people for money, because that's what it was, uh, it was about. And otherwise, I'd be a pretty hapless candidate. And the thing is, is that there's a whole other vote that goes on when you're running for office. And you may think that the vote occurs at the end when the general election occurs. But every three months, every quarter, every campaign has to submit to the Federal Election Committee a listing of how many contributions they received from how many contributors and how much that added up to. And that information is public knowledge. So what the press will do is will report how the campaign is doing, how many contributors you have, and how much money did you raise. And if those numbers don't look good, that little vote isn't going very well for you. So that's uh, an important thing in politics. It's not just the vote that comes at the end. It's that quarterly vote that gets taken every three months. So just to drive home that point, <laughs> running for office means asking people for money. And uh, it, this is a little bit from our call sheet. What we would do is uh, we'd get together and make up a list of uh, people who might be likely to contribute to the campaign. We'd make a list, uh, get the phone numbers, and then I would have what's called call time. And during call time, it would be my job to pick up the phone and call people and ask them for contributions. And it's not just me. That's what every candidate does. And it is the most hated part of any political campaign. If you ask any candidate, the part they hate the most is having to pick up the phone and ask for people for money. But it's on every candidate's schedule, call time. And that's what they need to be doing. And uh, you know, this, uh, this has an impact because just put yourself in the place of a candidate who's doing that uh, every day, who's calling and asking for money. That, if, let's say you're in that position, you're definitely going to appreciate those people who do uh, contribute, right? And so uh, does this make a difference? I'll just tell you, let's say you get elected and you come to your office and there's a uh, phone message from Lloyd Blankfein and a phone message from Karen Susan Hockfield. Who is, who's, are you going to return first? I'll just leave it for you uh, to decide. You might wonder, how much can you tri contribute in a campaign? Well, these are the con contribution limits for 2011 to 2012. And the key box to look at is right here, which is $2,500. So any individual can give $2,500 for an election. And that means an, a primary is considered an election, and the general election is considered an election. So if you give to somebody money, $2,500 in the primary, you can give them another $2,500 in the general. And, and if this is per individual, so a couple can give twice this amount. So if you had a couple that gave both in the, you know, if you had one individual gave in both, um, uh, you know, the general and the primary, that's a, a double maxer. And a double maxer are some of the most uh, prized uh, contributors in, the, in campaign finance. But just to give you a sense of what that means, is that in order to get $2,500, you can either get one $2,500 contribution, or you'd have to get a hundred $25 contributions. You have to get 100 people to contribute $25 to match this. And if you had five couples who were double maxers, you would need 2,000 people to contribute $25 to match that same amount of money. So just to, I just want to give you a little sense of what it's like to raise money uh, for a political campaign. And uh, this, uh, this quote, I enjoyed this quote from uh, uh, White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel, former White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel. Uh, Rahm Emanuel was a congressman himself, then he was White House Chief of Staff, and now he's mayor of Chicago. But this was his quote. He says, the first third of your campaign is money, money, money. The second third is money, money, and press. And the last third is votes, press, and money. So if you're keeping track, that's uh, six out of nine is the money. So obviously, uh, that's a very important uh, part of the campaign. But it's not the only thing. And we shouldn't underestimate the power of small contributions. And I'll come back to that in a little bit, why that's important. So the next area I want to talk to you about is participation. 
And uh, this is um, people who get involved in the early part of the campaign. We had uh, someone who took an interest in our campaign who was a lawyer and who was also very interested in new ways of uh, campaigning about identifying voters in specific ways and being able to reach them. But he had uh, uh, his contacts in the legal field, and he arranged for me to visit a couple of law firms. And they were uh, Skadden Arps and Quinn Emanuel. And this building here, that's Skadden Arps offices, is at four Times Square in New York City. And how that worked is that um, we went to Skadden, and they have an arrangement where if a partner wants to bring a candidate to speak, they just have to rent a room at the law firm. And then any of the lawyers there can come and hear that candidate speak. And if that's someone they want to support, they can do that. If not, they don't have to. But the uh, SCADN was in the habit of bringing candidates through uh, quite routinely. And that same tr also true for Quinn Emanuel, which is a large law firm. These are both national law firms, but Quinn Emanuel is mainly in California. So that was ha their approach to, uh, to, ca to candidates and campaigns. APAC is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and uh, they're very interested in uh, American uh, policy towards the Mideast. They sent me a questionnaire asking what my positions were on uh, those uh, issues, and they also came to visit our campaign headquarters. And then the Second Amendment Democrats was a group that was very concerned about gun rights, and they sent me a questionnaire and uh, asked about you know, positions on gun rights. But just like I showed you back in industry, uh, on the list of industries. One thing that I, I didn't have a lot of contact with were groups that were interested in science, technology, engineering. Um, for whatever reason, they did not seem to be prominently represented uh, here. And it may have been that they viewed me as a hapless candidate who didn't have much of a chance, or it could be they figured I was already making these points anyway. But I definitely came away with the impression that science, technology, and engineering is very much underrepresented in our political system. But this is participation at the big level. There's also participation at the small level. And I have to say that one of the most gratifying and fun parts of campaigning is just getting around and talking to people. And there are so many people in this state who are very deeply interested in what goes on in Washington and in the State House, who commit a lot of their time and effort to these issues. And it is really great to meet these people because they are so committed. And they will devote, devote their time. They'll open up their houses. They'll contribute their funds in order to advance this political process. And uh, you know, you, as a campaigner, you do different things. You, you interview with the press. Uh, you know, This was a house party or a gathering where different candidates could speak. Uh, this was a, you know, another, um, I think, a party gathering. Shake a lot of hands. But these are the places where you really find out what's on people's minds. This is where you give a presentation, then people ask you questions. And you can find out what are people concerned about? What are the kinds of questions that they're asking? What sort of issues are at the forefront of people's minds? And at these meetings, it's very important because you know these are people who are going to vote. These are people who will show up at the, at the, on election day, and they're people who get other people to show up on election day. And so if they're asking about things like, well, what's going to happen with the National Science Foundation? Or what about NASA? Or what about our science education? Or what are we doing about our uh, engineering infrastructure? If they're asking about those questions, you can bet that any candidate is going to come up with a policy and a position on those things. But I'll just leave you to imagine what happens if people are not asking those questions. So as a candidate, if you go to those events and people don't ask about that, you will very quickly get the impression that it's not something that people really care about, or they'd be asking about it. So the point I just want to drive home is that voting in the general election is just the final step in a process that has been underway for quite a while. By the time a candidate gets to the general election, They've spoken at hundreds of meetings. They've shaked, had answered thousands of questions. They've met thousands of people. They've been through a whole lot, visited a lot of different places, called a lot of people on the phone. And at the end, it's just a general election is just the final step. And it is very important what happens before that final step, which I worry that perhaps science and technology and engineering is not well represented in those earlier steps. 
The next thing I wanted to cover was uh, ideas. And uh, here you're just going to have to take my word for it. This is just uh, my opinion that ideas matter. Uh, there are some people uh, who would say that if you want to be a successful candidate, all you have to do is go to either the Republican or Democratic website, copy down what the platform is, and then go out and show that you can be successful at raising money. And that's all you really need to do to be a good candidate. And you know, there may be some truth in that. But I do believe that if you can get across to people ideas that are important and that they do catch on, you can start to change the dialogue. And one thing we were very concerned about you know, was technology and innovation. And I, I believe that as we started speaking about this at more and more meetings and bringing it up as an issue at other gatherings, every time you speak at a meeting, you're there, but so are your fellow candidates, the other people who you're competing with in the primary. And I tended to notice that over time, they started to adopt these positions as well. Because if people responded well to them, then other people would bring them forward. And so that it does matter, this participation at this uh, grassroots level, it eventually starts to percolate through the system. If people are asking and stating these problems, they'll get addressed. If they're not being brought up, they won't get addressed. And I think as a group, we try to be fairly serious about, uh, about our policies and, and look into uh, the issues and try to present a coherent set of policy and proposals. And I thought that that did make a difference. But again, I have to say, that's uh, just my opinion. Then the next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, voting. Because voting is the thing that can overcome all the other factors. It can overcome the money. It can overcome the participation, overcome ideas. Basically, the bottom line is that if you vote, that's the decisive test. Well, what I wanted to show you here was uh, a graph that shows turnout in uh, elections. And so what we have here on the x-axis year, and then this is percentage of the voting eligible population that turns out. And what you can see is that it varies between about 60% in a presidential election year to around 40% uh, in the off years. And there are kind of two approaches to, uh, to trying to get people to vote for you in the election. One is that if you can convince people that your agenda and that you are the best uh, candidate or the best for the country, that that's uh, one way to do it. And that tends to work best in a high turnout election, uh, because there you can't really influence how many people go to the polls, but you can influence how they vote. But if you have low turnout, another approach is to try to increase the turnout among those people who are most passionate about you. Because if a majority of people are going to sit home anyway, what counts is getting those people who are most uh, passionate, most concerned, most active out to the polls. And I will hypothesize that that's one reason that we see so much polarization and emotion in politics today, that that's one way to drive turnout. So if you can get your base out, that's a, a good way to be successful in a low turnout uh, election. So uh, that's uh, just something that, uh, to keep in mind when we see how our political system is working right now. But I also think a lot of people look at voting and say, hey, my vote doesn't matter. Uh, if I go, I'm just one vote out of millions or thousands, how could that possibly make any difference? And I, I want to show you an example here that it does uh, make a difference. So this is uh, the voting results from the Republican primary for the 2010 Senate race that we were talking about earlier. So this is the, uh, the primary that took place on the Republican side. And the total number of votes cast were around 140,000. Uh, and that's pretty high for a primary in New Hampshire. Often it's like 60,000. But what you can see here is that the difference between the two candidates, the two leading candidates, was around 2,000 votes. You could get 2,000 votes here in the Upper Valley. You could probably get 2,000 volts here at Dartmouth. You could shake 2,000 people's hands. I mean, if you imagine that one of these candidates that, say, had a very strong agenda in science, technology, and engineering, just the turnout from the Thayer School could be decisive in an election like this. So that voting really does matter. It just, uh, we tend to always think about the general election when there are thousands, uh, maybe millions of people voting. But in these primary elections, 
A small shift in either direction can make a tremendous difference, and then that's the candidate who goes on to the general election. So, oh, and I also want to make one other uh, point about this, is uh, I, we talked about contributions, money, about how money makes a big difference. Well, the reason that small contributions make a big difference is that when somebody gives a small amount of money, so maybe that's not going to impress the total bottom line fundraising numbers, but that's a signal that that person is going to show up to vote. And so as somebody who has a large number of small contributors, that's powerful. Because that shows that that person, maybe they don't have a huge uh, lot of money, but if somebody has five double maxers and someone has $2,000, $25 contributors, that $2,000 there is going to make a big difference. So money does, small money can make a difference. And I don't want to get, leave you with the impression that it all, all, only thing counts are big uh, donations. But ultimately, what this is all about is the, our political system tells us about what kind of nation we are, what kind of nation we want to be. And we've been very fortunate to have a nation that has been very uh, focused on technology and innovation and engineering. We've had many uh, a leadership role in this for quite some time. And it's no accident. I mean, looking back at the founders, I mean, both Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were statesmen, yes. But you know, Ben Franklin did, was very curious about science and did experiments with electricity. Uh, Jefferson, who was very involved in agriculture and, uh, and architecture. And even science shows up in the Constitution. Here's section eight of the Constitution, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective offerings. So that even in the Constitution, the promotion of science is an ideal that's been part of this nation for so long. So you can look at that, or you can look at this quote from uh, Winston Churchill, uh, that scientists should be on tap, but not on top. And uh, I'll let you decide whether you think that would be a good approach or, or not in an age that uh, where science and technology are such an important part uh, of our economic success. So ultimately, the point I want to make here, in the political system, it's not about facts and it's not about being right. It's about competing interests. The idea that if these different interests compete, that's going to end up with some sort of rough approximation of the truth. But it's not about, there's no fact checker out there in chief who's going to you know, catch you if you say something wrong. I mean, you probably see every day in the news things that anybody with five minutes and an internet connection could figure out aren't true. But that's not what matters. What matters is the competing interests that people are out there in the political system looking out for their interest. The assumption is, is that people will do that. And people who don't do that can expect not to see their interests represented in the political system. Because in a system, in a system of competing interests, if you don't compete, your interests aren't represented, even if the era, area is critical, future economic success. I mean, I would argue that the most important thing we can do for jobs and economic growth and for maintaining our standard of living is promoting our science and, and technology and innovation and engineering and science education. Those are absolutely critical things. But if no one's making the case for it at political meetings and no one's asking questions about it, it's, it, it's not going to happen. Most candidates uh, in politics are from law or business. Uh, retired people and people in the financial law and real estate areas provide most campaign funds. And again, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I'm not criticizing that. I just want to point out that these people are getting involved and being involved. The problem is, is, is people who aren't involved. Uh, candidates will address new ideas if those ideas have traction. So if, uh, if people are showing up at political meetings and asking questions about a particular area, that area will be deemed as being important. If candidates never hear anything about it, they're going to draw the logical conclusion that people just don't care about that. Or else, if they did care about it, they'd be asking about it. And then, uh, ultimately, votes count. And groups that get people to the polls get attention. Because at the end of the day, a candidate has to be concerned about who's going to show up to vote and, and will they be there when they're needed. So I, I just wanted to conclude. Um, 
that basically, in my opinion, this is the greatest country on earth. But it doesn't have to stay that way. There's no law that says we have to remain leaders in science and technology and, and engineering. That's something that depends on us individually to want to do. That we have to have the desire and the drive to be involved to make this happen. Because it isn't written anywhere that this has to be the case. We live in a political system that gives us the opportunity to make it the case. But if nobody makes that case, it's not going to happen. And then every generation has that responsibility. We have been well served by a generation of people who have fought to have this uh, country be such a leader. And it's now incumbent upon us to pick up that, uh, that, that mantle, to pick up that torch and carry it forward. Because if it's not carried forward, it won't happen. And then cynicism, I believe, is a luxury. I know I hear people will say, oh, that candidate, um, you know, they, they don't keep their promises, or uh, you know, they're not that smart, or, or whatever. But the thing is, they're just people like you and me. And they're, they're doing the best they can in the system as it exists. I mean, to say uh, that we don't want to be in politics because we don't like the way it, it is, or we don't like what people say, you know, that's like saying, well, I don't want to eat food because farmers get their hands dirty. I mean, the thing is, is that that is just the system that we have, and we have to live with it the way it is. And then politics, lastly, it's not a spectator sport. It's not something that we read about in the paper or chuckle about the foibles or things like that. It is a participatory activity that all of us should be keenly aware of. Because our future as an economic power about jobs and all that stuff is keenly linked to our involvement in the political system. And uh, so basically, those are the lessons that, uh, that I learned. And uh, I just uh, will close with just a few little uh, suggestions. If you ask me what you can do, I would suggest organize, invite candidates, ask questions. Are we bringing candidates here? And if we can't bring them to Dartmouth, can we form a group that would invite them to come and talk about science and technology and engineering? Candidates would definitely come. Do you, this year, we are going to be having, it's going to be a presidential primary year. We're going to have every presidential candidate in the nation is going to be coming through this town. It would be a shame if they left here and didn't get asked about the National Science Foundation, about NASA, about science education, about PhDs. If they leave here without getting asked those questions, that's our problem, not theirs. And host a house party or an event. Uh, some of you might be wondering, well, what if I host a dud? You know, what if my candidate turns out to do something embarrassing later on? Well, that's just a chance you take. But it, it, the thing is, is that it, people, if they host, ha host a house party, invite other people to come, candidates appreciate that. That's what they need. They need to get in touch with people and meet them, shake hands, and raise money. Uh, attend political events. Well, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, attend political meetings. Again, asking questions is critical. If questions don't get asked, uh, candidates are going to assume that people don't care. Contribute to the candidates you support. Remember, even a small contribution matters because it's a token. It shows that what that person is saying is attracting attention. And so when that candidate goes to file their FEC report, it's nice to know that they have these supporters who have who've seen fit to contribute to them. And then contribute to blogs, write letters, contact Congress. If you see Congress passing a law that you don't think is a good idea, you should be firing that letter off right away. I know I'm guilty of not doing that all the time, but it's something that it's all part of participatory democracy. If we want to stay the leader in science and technology and engineering that we've been for so many years, I think all of us need to be critically involved day to day. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. And I'm uh, <laughs> to take questions. <laughs> well, that, that's a 
That's a historical <laughs> item. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. I, well, I, that's very flattering. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. Um, so when did money start to dominate politics? You know, I'm not, uh, there's a, a good book on that. The one, I actually had a quote from that book, which is called uh, Winner Take All Politics. It has some nice graphs in it about how the rising cost of political campaigns. And it's usually, it's been really over the last 10 to 20 years that the, you know, it's been going up so dramatically. Um, why that is, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. There are a lot of different people have different theories. But as far as why science and technology um, is not well represented, I am just worried that uh, for us in the science and technology fields just tend not to be involved enough in the political process. So uh, I guess what I was trying to convey here that when I was out campaigning, I just didn't s see a lot of that. Um, you know, I saw a lot of other people concerned about their issues, and I understood what they were looking for out of government. But I, you know, although people responded to what I was saying, obviously I would talk a lot about science and technology, and people responded to that. Um, I didn't see a lot of other groups who were trying to, you know, promote that cause, because it's, uh, you know, people just have to volunteer and decide that it's important and want to go do it. Maybe it could be momentum. I don't know, or you know, people don't perceive perhaps that it's a crisis. That could be. I guess, yeah, so um, I, I, I guess I can give you an example of what's happening right now. So for example, um, and this again, just my opinion, but you can, you can see it in sort of real time. So recently, Congress passed a legislation about Medicare. Then there was recess, and congressmen went back to their districts and, uh, and then met with their constituents and then responded to that. So uh, just in our district right here, we had uh, Charlie Bass, voted for the Ryan plan, came back to New Hampshire for that week, and then wrote an op-ed stating how uh, he just wanted to clarify that he was not against, he did, was against changing the way Medicare is. So I mean, you can see the <laughs> action response right there is because people showed up Express their displeasure, and the position was changed like that. <laughs> well, his vote wasn't changed because people weren't up there ahead of time. And uh, so, um, no, I, I, unfortunately, it involves these days, I, it, it involves a lot, I mean, just like everything else. I mean, I feel bad because, you know, we all know we have to take care of our health and we need to spend more time on this and more time on that. And I guess what I'm telling you is we just have to 
One thing I do is I subscribe to this thing from congress.org that tells me how my, uh, my reps and senators vote on every issue. So it tells me what bills are coming up and how they voted. And so I'll know that. And then I can write off to them and say, wait, I, I, I see this bill coming up, and that's not a good, uh, I don't support that. And it would be a good, you know, it used to be people would have sort of political groups who would say, hey, just to let you know, there's this legislation coming down the pike that's going to, you know, cut the National Science Foundation by 20% or whatever like that. We need to get a letter campaign going and sort of be proactive about stuff that's coming down the pike in Congress. I think people just aren't tracking that like it used to be. Uh, it would be my impression. So, uh, you know, like some of these recent budget bills uh, would cut non-defense discretionary spending by tremendous amounts. I have no idea what the impact would be on things like the National Science Foundation or NASA or anything like that, but it wouldn't be good. Uh, but I don't see that as a hot item of discussion. Uh, you know, the items that are discussed are things like Medicare, and because uh, one, I'll just point out that people who are retired are big contributors and big attenders at political meetings, and so there's going to be a lot of discussion about Medicare. Uh, but there's probably not going to be much discussion about science and technology and engineering. Um, so I'm a grad student and I'm part of a MSF fellowship that has gotten more into technology, so now I'm digital. I um, follow all sorts of other people I have, um, so I can follow the report. And I need to get a sense of what's going on in my clinic, but I really appreciate your call to action as well as another way to complement that. Oh, you know, that, you know, we're getting, going into political science, yeah. But uh, what often happens, at least here in the U.S., with it, you know, because we don't have a parliamentary system. Uh, you know, in the parliamentary system, we have uh, where people have to form coalition governments. You can have more parties because a, a minority party, you know, can then join with another one to form a government. But here, what tends to happen, the third party will either will will tend to subtract from the, the group that it's most like. <laughs> so uh, it usually tends to be a vote splitter and ends up, uh, um, yeah, it, it, they don't tend to be stable and don't tend to exist for long periods of time. Um, but again, that's a political science uh, question. Although they can, uh, third parties bring up a lot of new agenda items, so they're often, uh, often good that way. Oh, I think that's essential. I mean, I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, I, at the end of this, I ended up thinking we ought to have public financing campaigns. I mean, I think we've made like debate club the most expensive extracurricular activity. You know, it's, you know, I mean, doing this, which is basically going and talking to people, presenting ideas. You know, discussions is, is just not shouldn't cost as much as it does. I mean, <laughs> you know, why is this so cost? It sh it just shouldn't be that way. It's ridiculous. It and uh, it's and it's a, and it's a, like a an escalation. You know, because everybody has to throw more in in order to you know try to get the louder megaphone. Yeah, I don't. You know. When I, uh, so I don't know the details of all these different plans. The group that I think has come the long, uh, farthest uh, in this is called Americans for Campaign Reform, um, or it's called U Street now. And they've brought together a bipartisan group of people who, you know, like Bill Bradley and Alan Simpson and things like that, coming up with a plan on how to try to, how to, try to reform, you know, reform campaign finance and come up with a system that you know, still has some you know, you're not going to get rid of money in politics, but try to make it more rational. And, and again, I, I don't want to make it, money in politics is not all bad. I mean, these small contributions, they are tokens that, you know, this is somebody who people are responding to. But it definitely has gotten out of hand. So I, I do like that organization, U Street or American for Campaign Reform. Oh. Yeah, if you don't close your campaign account, you can hold on to that money and use it for your next campaign. <laughs> <laughs>
And you can also con help contribute to another candidate. But you can't use it personally. No, no, you can't use it personally. No, it has to be used for, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, it has to be used for campaign expenses. Yeah. And uh, oh, filing those FEC reports, that's a real lot of fun, I'll tell you. That's uh, so. I had a question regarding what is being done with that money? What is it being spent on? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, so, so basically to run the campaign, you need a campaign staff, so a campaign manager, a campaign uh, staff. Uh, you, you know, you're going to have to have an office. Uh, a lot of it's traveling around the state. Those are the easy things. And then things you see like the bumper stickers and the signs and uh, you know, that sort of thing. Then a lot of it goes for TV and radio ads, particularly at the end. That's, uh, that's where the really big buys occur, you know, because what, what happens, and you've all seen this, is that even though everybody complains about negative campaigns, negative campaigns work. You know, people will often vote against somebody rather than for someone. And so towards the end, there comes kind of a war of negative campaigns, and you don't want to be caught short. You know, so if you can't respond to a negative ad, then you're, you're, you're in trouble. So everybody puts together a big war chest so they can you know, get out those, those ads at the end in order to fight off any you know, big negative campaign. Do you know what proportion of that money uh, um, No, sorry. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's, it's big. Yeah. One more question? <laughs> what experiments? So uh, our mission was totally devoted, devoted to studying the brain and nervous system and how it adapts to weightlessness and then readapts to being on Earth. And uh, it, so we look at things having to do with balance, uh, the integration of senses, uh, sleep, blood pressure control. But I wrote, uh, we have a book. I edited a book with all the results from the neural lab mission. And uh, so that, um, contact me. I can send you a link and you can see everything that was done on the mission. Sure. All right, well, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.